show emanates from Los Angeles, California. Now, this program is heard via the World Wide Web in over 143 countries. In an effort to understand racism and white supremacy, we continue our platform for understanding. My guest is Neely Fuller. Now, I want you to underline a recommended reading. Textbook for Victims of Racism and White Supremacy. I believe it was published back in 1964. Now, we're going to give you the number to order uh, Mr. Fuller's book, Neely Fuller's book, a little later on. Neely Fuller, welcome to the Ted Terry Show. Yes, thank you. You're welcome, sir. And, uh, Mr. Fuller, I recently interviewed uh, Dr. Francis Crest Wilson, Welsing on uh, the subject of racism and white supremacy. It is my understanding that you played a key role in the good doctor's efforts uh, in putting pieces of the puzzle together in her quest to understand the processes of racism and white supremacy. Can you tell us how your contribution was pivotal uh, then, and where are we now in the pursuit for justice for victims of racism and white supremacy? Well, uh, for one thing, to start with, I, uh, I equated the two. You equated the two? Yes, racism is white supremacy. White okay. supremacy is racism. Okay. Now, these, uh, and following with the textbook for victims of racism, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things to focus on, or the things that I focused on, was the use of words. Okay. Because that's the cement that holds the system together, other than violence. The words are used to deceive the victims. The and words are used to deceive the victims? Yes. Okay. Uh, when these, whoever thought up the idea of racism, white supremacy, had to, according to the evidence, think in terms of, now in order to make this system work, we'll have to use words, uh, which means we will use the words to deceive people. And in order to deceive people, we'll have to use word tricks. Okay. And when the word tricks don't work, then we will back it up with direct violence. Because when you're deceiving people to their detriment, that is a form of indirect violence. Okay. So the, the key thing to do in dealing with the non-white people of the world, that is whatever white people got together directly and indirectly and thought up the idea of racism, they decided apparently that that would be the best way to go in the most efficient manner. It turned out to be the most powerful idea, political idea, for motivating people and getting people to do things at your bidding than any other idea ever conceived in the minds of people. It turned out to be the most powerful religion on earth, and that is the ideology of racism and or white supremacy, which, here again, they're both the same thing. Racism is white supremacy. White supremacy is racism. There's no other form of racism on the planet. Now, Mr. Fuller, what we'd like to do on the Ted Terry Show is to give you a platform. Uh, in other words, I'm the student. You're the teacher. You have the, the microphone. We'd like for you to teach us about racism and the white supremacy. So if you would, give us a lesson on what we don't know. Okay. The uh, Well, I don't know what it is that people don't know, but <laughs> I, I do know that the racists are the smartest people on the planet. The white people, who, whomever they happen to be, wherever they happen to be, even as we speak, are the smartest and the most powerful people on the planet. Uh, now, what you do in order to come to these conclusions is not follow what Neely Fuller says, not follow what any particular person says. You follow the logic, because one thing that came with the entire universe is a thing called logic. The white supremacists, or the people who thought it up, used a logical process for doing so. That's why it has lasted so long and has become the monumental world problem that most people, including all of the scholars, all of the people in academia, say that they don't have the solution to. Almost everyone comes to the microphone saying, I can talk about it, but I haven't figured out exactly what to do about it. So it's a well-put-together package. It is 
as someone recently said, not rocket science. <laughs> it is harder than rocket science, but yet it is simplistic in basic formula. Explain. Meaning someone just uh, decided that, uh, looking around, presumably, this is based on logic. Someone had to look at the people on the planet and say, now some of the people are dark and some of the people are light. And the lightest of the people, the people who appear to be lightest, we will call them white people. Now, the dark people, we will call them non-white people. And let's think up an idea. Now, here's what we'll do. We will think up a system based on the royalist platform, meaning holier than thou. Mm -hmm. uh, we will carry that forth. The royalist system is based on some people being better than others. That's the whole idea of royalty. Uh, that's why they say the royalty, uh, the king can do no wrong. Mm -hmm. Kings and queens, they are the people who are the smartest or the most divine or the most everything that's supposed to be of the most constructive value. This is how people have come up with the idea of royalty. Okay. Now, where the idea of royalty came from, I don't know. Just like I don't know the idea of where racism came from, except the evidence shows that somebody put it in place. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. And apparently, they used the royalist format, meaning you will have a category of people who, because of their whiteness, would lord it over all of the people that they classify as non-white. And the first thing they get a handle on is they do the classifying. The people who are subordinate do, do not do the classifying, even though in this day and time, under the refinement of racism, they allow them to say what they are. But the bottom line, the supreme judges will be the people who believe in white supremacy. That's a political idea. Say, we will, if you're white, you belong to the club. Now, you might be in a pecking order within the club, but you are in the club. Now, you can reject your membership at any time, but you do at great risk to all of your comforts. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty big incentive for the average white person to not opt out of the white club, mm -hmm. what you might call the white race or the white nation. Now, these are the people that run the planet, those people who have chosen to be in the club. Those who have chosen not to be in the club are not powerful. They immediately lose their power. So you're saying racism is a global system? It's a global system. And it is uh, the, the, it, the white nation, meaning the collective white supremacists, are the only real nation on the planet. See, uh, what I call counter-racist codification calls for a whole other perspective on how the world is run, and based on evidence. It just can't be based on theory. You have to be able to show some substance to what you're saying. That's why I say you follow the logic. Now, let, let's, let's go back um, so we can give our audience uh, a foundation. Uh, you, you didn't just start out yesterday uh, stu studying racism uh, and uh, white supremacy. Uh, take us back in time. I understand you were in the Korean War uh, at that time uh, when you uh, was uh, collaborating with uh, Francis Cress Welsing. Is that true? No, I didn't, you know her until the, I didn't know her until the late 19... I didn't meet her until the late 1960s. I no, started 60s, writing. Yes, I mean, you, but you were a veteran of the Korean War. Yes. Yes. And in 1960s, you met her. Now, uh, let's go forward from there. But your research into the racism and white supremacy... How did you come about that and uh, some of the things that uh, brought you up until today? Well, people were talking about in the 1950s racial integration and racial segregation. I didn't understand the terms. And even today, the terms do not make sense because there's no way to integrate racism. And mm -hmm. there's no way to segregate racism. If you're talking about racial segregation, I don't know who thought up the terms, but they are, they are a poor choice of words. The words are very important. Because if you use the words for vehicles of communications, they don't communicate very much. Uh, what is an integrated black person? Say, if you're talking about racial integration, is a black person integrated when he or she is standing three feet away from a white person? Or is it seven feet? 
or is it 30 yards, or is it 50 miles, or is it two inches? <laughs> I mean, what qualifies you to be an integrated black person? When are you integrated? How you, can you quantify it? See, everything is razor sharp in racism, which mm -hmm. means you have to define everything that you say. And everything that you say has to make super sense, not just maybe sense. It has to be razor sharp because something as intricate and as exact and as functional as racism could not exist if it wasn't an exact science which means the words have to apply. But the words that are thrown out by the white supremacists themselves are designed to confuse the victims. And these are the two terms that I first heard, and I was confused. Because I said, you know, there's, if you're talking about racial segregation, meaning black people and white people are not in contact with each other, I never knew a time when that wasn't so. Black people and white people have always been in contact with each other. Otherwise, how could you have a racial system based on slavery? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to have contact. So what are we talking about here? So we're talking about basically a power relationship. Well, then we should use terms that explain that. So what we're talking about is white supremacy, not racial segregation, not racial integration. You're talking about an entire system of white supremacy. So you get that straight first. Get the word straight. That's what's in place okay. now. That's what has always been in place since it was first put in place. And you call it that, the system of white supremacy worldwide. That's what you call it. And you get rid of whole tons of other words that are confusing. Racial integration, racial segregation are two words that you don't hardly hear people use anymore because they were always, right from the beginning, confusing. You have a system of white supremacy in place. What you want to do, or should want to do, is replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice. Now, the system of justice has never existed, as far as anybody knows in recorded history because you give a definition to the word justice. There is no legal definition for the word justice. I have been informed. Maybe some legal scholars can say that there is. <laughs> All the legal scholars that I have heard from have said that there isn't. So you give it a compensatory definition. That's when I started writing. That's why I call the work that I put out the compensatory code, mm -hmm. meaning making up for what's missing. What's missing is justice more than anything else on earth among people is justice but you have to have a definition that makes sense so i came up with the initial term back in the 1950s of balance between people but that doesn't explain anything in detail sounds catchy <laughs> but it's not in detail see it's all in the details so i came up recently with i'll say in the last 10 years with a more elaborate and more detailed definition, and it's in two parts. Compensatory definition of justice is as follows. Guaranteeing that no person is mistreated. That's part one. Mm -hmm. Part two, guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most help. Now, that's in all nine areas of activity. Every minute of every day, you have to guarantee this. It's never been done because you're talking about nine areas of activity regard, and it's in regard to everybody everywhere simultaneously. It's never been done. It's just a concept. And that's uh, these areas of activity. I came up with uh, the nine areas, which I, in a compensatory fashion, made up. And I think they cover just about everything that everyone is doing at any given moment, any time on the planet and that is economics, you're engaging in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now, all of these areas are interactive, meaning what you do in the area of religion affects what you do in the area of law. 
What you do in the area of law affects what you do in the area of politics. What you do in the area of politics affects what you do in the area of sex or education or economics and on and on and on. Uh, these are just labels for what people do because everything in the universe comes down to saying and doing. Now, when I started writing what I call the compensatory counter-racist code, I kept that in mind, that out of 10 million things to do in any given situation, every person on the planet should try to do the best possible thing that anybody can ever do in that same situation. I just threw out a, a number there, 10 million. Uh, that's, I think that's broad enough. You just threw them out. Yes. <laughs> now, that's the doing part. Okay. Now, in the saying part, out of 10 million things to say in any given situation, on the job, anything else, a person should want to say the best possible thing that anybody can ever say of those 10 million things. And uh, if a person just goes into every situation with that in mind, it gives that person focus, which is what the white supremacists never want their victims to have. This is why black people, even today, are some of the most confused, if not the most confused people on earth, because the system of racism is designed to keep them endlessly confused. They might be animated. They might be jumping up and down and going here and going there and doing this and doing that. But no focus, maximum confusion. That is tailor-made for people who are orchestrated or who have, who have a code for getting and keeping power. You keep your victims, first of all, confused. Now, having said that, let me give an illustration. Ten people in a room. The person who is most focused and less confused out of the ten people, that one person out of the ten will have control over the other nine. That's the logic. That's what I mean by following the logic. Mm -hmm. If you have nine people in a room who are confused about what they're there for, what they're supposed to be doing, why they're doing it, but there's one person that knows it all about why they're there what they're supposed to be doing, what is going to happen as a result of their being there, okay. how long they're going to be there. Okay. All right. That one person will dominate the other nine. That's just what you call kindergarten logic. Okay. And that's what codification is really about. That's a lengthy answer to that one question. No, it's a good answer. I, I, I'm, as I said, I'm the student and listening and, uh, uh, and, and taking all this in. Let me uh, inform our audience you're listening to the Ted Terry Show on the Blake Radio Network. Uh, we're having a, a, a wonderful conversation with uh, Neely Fuller, and we're dis discussing racism, white supremacy, and, uh, and and I am enjoying this conversation because I think, uh, and I hope I'm correcting saying this, uh, Mr. Fuller, we need to put a face on the words. Is that true? We need to put a face on the on the what? On the words. Yes, yes. Pay a, pay a, the, that's the key to it. That's initially when you do anything that calls for wording. Mm -hmm. In other words, like if you have a concept of what living is all about, what the universe is all about, you try to put it into words that will lead you to the truth. Uh -huh. So you have that means you have to pay attention to all of the words because what the white supremacists do or what any person who is anti-justice will do is, first of all, try to stay away from what the truth of the matter is as far as the victims are concerned. The victims will be dealing with falsehood. So the person who is going to be in charge and be opposed to the victims, in other words, try to keep the victims being victims, they are going to know what the truth is, but they are going to use the truth in such a way that they can convey falsehood to the victims so that the victims will be what? Confused. confused. See, the whole idea is to sow confusion, to have the people who are being victimized always, forever, non-focused, 
walking around bumping into each other <laughs> and not knowing what to do about anything or what to even figure out about what's going on and forever be asking the question, what's happening, and not having an answer. Uh, I have to ask you this question, Mr. Fuller. You had uh, made a statement and I heard you say this over another uh, interview, uh, you said black people need to stay away from each other. Since you brought up black people in your last statement, um, why did you say that black people need to stay away from each other unless there's going to be some productivity? Yes. Black people should stay away from each other because as victims of racism, the racists have filled our minds full of poison. So whenever we come in contact with each other, the poison immediately begins to spread. Black people walk around full of poison. You can almost see it in our eyes. When we pass each other on the sidewalks, we're loaded with it. It's been put there. We weren't born with it. We didn't have that look in our eyes when we were little people, just little toddlers. We were wide open to the world, just like all people are when you're a toddler. But when you are in an evil system, a system that is designed deliberately to produce evil thoughts, to produce animosity, to produce violence, then that toddler, as he or she grows, begins to pick up the poison that's already here. And then the poison is spread as that person comes in contact particularly with persons of like persuasion. This is why black people sitting on a bus, you can almost feel the atmosphere of hostility there. That's not a natural thing. That's artificial. And it's all put there by the white supremacists long before the bus was built, long before the people got on the bus. Every black person must realize this. So what do you do about it? Codification is all about what you do. You make sure that anything that you say to someone before you open your mouth is of constructive value. Anything that you do with someone, you sit down and plan it first and make sure that what you are planning is of constructive value. Otherwise, black people should go the other way when they see each other. They shouldn't even come in contact with each other. They should cross the street almost before they say anything to each other because once they say anything, the poison starts unless they already have something in mind to say that is of constructive value. And we just tried this. This is what you call the process of counter-racist codification. You're working against racism right there. But see, black people just cannot continue to do like they're doing, and that is wait until they make contact and then try to figure out what to say and what to do, and it comes out all messed up right from the jump. As we well know from experience, we should have learned that by now. So we should agree that we avoid each other, avoid each other like we are carrying SARS. That's what I was going to say, uh, put in the terms of uh, that we're, we're carrying viruses. Yes. Yes, there is such a virus as, you know, social viruses that we send, messages that we send with eye contact, with everything. This is why you'll find a black person who will gun down someone with a 9 millimeter in a line in a grocery store about nothing but a look. Mm -hmm. We're so full of poison, we're loaded with it. So if we back off from each other, avoid each other, and say, now, I'm not going to say anything to this person that I see coming a block away unless it's something constructive. Otherwise, I'm going to avoid eye contact and every other kind of contact. Well, see, now, there is a governor on black people where that poison doesn't take place, and that is when that same black people, two black people coming down the street, they will start building up poison for each other a block away. But when they come in contact with white people, the poison is nullified because they know that white people can put a hurting on them. They know where power really is. 
that's Unless, of course, they happen to corner some white person off somewhere in an alley or something. Mm -hmm. But black people don't have that automatic poison rising to the surface because the poison hasn't been put there for them to have that kind of animosity toward white people. Now, that's not to say that it should be there, but the poison shouldn't be there at all. Black people should be like Mr. Rogers when it comes to interacting with each other. <laughs> Is this subconsciously, uh, subconscious, that we have this poison in us and, and that are not aware of it? And I know that uh, the answer to the question, but I have to pose the question to you. We're not only aware of it, we have come to glorify it. Black people wake up in the morning thinking about how we can spread poison among each other. Consciously we call or it, subconsciously? We, it's, it's, well, it's conscious because now it has become the black lifestyle. We call it the ghetto lifestyle. We call it the black community lifestyle. It is a major disaster of the planet. Major. This is why we slaughter each other all over the planet in huge numbers, just like it's nothing at all. It's nothing like the sound of the 9 millimeter, one of Adolf Hitler's favorite cartridges. Hitler's been long dead, and he is reported to have not cared very much for black people. But mm -hmm. one of the bullets that came out of World War II was a 9 millimeter cartridge, and it is being used everywhere among black people and glorified as the principal instrument for spreading poison and making death among black people wherever they happen to be. The sound of the nine millimeter in the night. Pow, 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 pow. Glorified and enjoyed by many black people wherever they happen to be. It is a total universal disgrace. But we have that. So how do you avoid it? Avoid contact. A bunch of black people getting together, 10 of them, with no constructive agenda, always means something ugly. Always. No constructive agenda. Pre-planned in detail. The Million Man March worked because it was pre-planned. So and what about it that? was of constructive value. And so everyone the understood that. What See, it's the not church? something that's in the people uh, by nature. Uh -huh. Is something that's carefully planted there. So you can plant, you can remove that, if no more than just temporarily, by having a plan. Say now, when everyone does this, when we all come together, the agenda is as follows. Everyone will deport themselves with decorum. There will be no throwing down of trash. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to throw some down or see some that's been thrown down, pick it up and put it in a receptacle. Now, see, this is a pre-plan. Now, black people work very well. This is why the churches, for the most part, work. When black people come to church, they have a code. That's what I was going to ask you about the black so church. So black people, well, right. when black people at least come to church, they at least have an agreement in advance. Mm -hmm. so we're going to kind of act like for a few hours we have some sense. Mm -hmm. Unlike the way we acted when we before we came in here, even though when we leave here we're going to revert to type. But for two or three hours, we're going to go according to the little code that we have set up about the way you conduct yourself doing these services. And so that's just a little respite. <laughs> what about religion? Well, religion is nothing. Uh, here again, you define what is a religion. It's a strong belief backed up by action. Okay. Now, the strongest religion on the planet is the religion of white supremacy. Now, a person might say, well, white supremacy is not a religion. Yes, it is. It's a strong belief backed up by action that has a God. Well, what is the God of a white supremacist? The God of a white supremacist is a white supremacist. They are their own gods. This is why they are very determined and very focused and very arrogant and very efficient. When they get ready to do anything, they have total confidence. And they do not take kindly to any images of a God 
that does not look exactly like them. They consider any other images as being inferior or non-existent. Okay. So it's everything that a white supremacist does reinforces white supremacy. They don't come around. They don't even come around black people unless they have that in mind. Or unless they Everything. have to. Unless they have to. Yes. And the only time they do, the only time they show up anywhere, it has something to do with the muscle of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they're not going to show. Even when they come in the guise of doing other things, as people who are called Indians will testify, they'll say that they come here again with the words, the forked tongue. And they're very efficient. But I don't want to spend all of the day just talking about